I hear everybody getting quiet. I guess that means it's time to start. So welcome. Um, I'll be talking about some adventures I've been having in the industrial IO, IIO subsystem. And of course, what you all really came for, hopefully something about some Lego robots. So I'm David Lechner. I'm an embedded software engineer at Bay Libra. Uh, Bay Libra is a consulting firm We're based in Nice, France, but we've got remote people scattered all over the world. As you can tell, I don't have a French accent. Uh, we love everything embedded and open source, uh, especially Linux kernel, Android. We're starting to get into Zephyr, and we also recently hired the code sorcery team, so now we've got uh, tool chain services that we can offer. Uh, I've only been working at Bay Libre for about six months now, so my background in Linux kernel hacking actually comes from playing with Lego robots. The Lego Mindstorms EV3 that came out in 2013 runs Linux, and uh, I spent quite a few years hacking on it. We ported Debian Linux to it, and I started sending kernel patches upstream, and that's how I learned everything I know about uh, being a kernel developer, maintainer. And then more recently, um, another gentleman and I, Lawrence Volk, uh, started a project called PyBricks, which the more recent LEGO robots don't run Linux. They're more constrained microcontrollers, but we're running MicroPython on them. And um, before that, I was, I actually started my career in industrial automation, automating water and wastewater treatment plants. So I had kind of a bit of a non-traditional career path to get where I am today, but it's all come together uh, in the industrial IO system now. So I've got five little adventures to tell you about today. Uh, if you're following along at home, watching the reruns on YouTube or the PDF, you can choose your own adventure. But I've got a captive audience today, so we'll go through them all. Uh, the first couple ones are going to be talking about uh, hardware aspects of what we're working on and kind of day to day, how we uh, managed to get remote workers working on industrial IIO, analog digital converter type hardware. And then the last three ones are a little bit of a report on interesting things that are going on upstream in the IIO subsystem. So for those of you who don't know, industrial IIO subsystem is the corner of the convert, uh, kernel where anything that's an analog digital converter or digital to analog converter hangs out. That uh, It's all about measuring and signals and things like that. So our first adventure, the adventure of the remote IIO developers. Um, as we mentioned, uh, we've got developers all over the world at Bay Libra. So our team that's working on this particular project of upstreaming some support for some analog digital converters and also developing other user space tools. We're also doing a little Zephyr, uh, bare metal type stuff for the same analog digital converters. Uh, we've got about six fully remote people, a couple hybrid that are in the office some days, remote some days, and one person in the office full time. So uh, we kind of like to share what we're doing and hopefully in the Q&A compare notes with anybody else who's doing any similar kind of work like this to see uh, you know, what's working, what's not working. So. Uh, to start with, uh, early on in this project, we decided that we're going to keep all of our hardware in our lab in France. So as a developer, we're connecting remotely to a hardware stack like this. And um, in the next slide, I'll zoom in on what we're actually looking at. But for now, we'll just appreciate the aesthetics of it. Shout out to Fabian on our team for uh, making this all nice and neat getting all the cable management done. So here we've got uh, eight development boards set up that people can remotely connect to to develop their drivers, test them out. 
Um, and it looks pretty cool at night, too. So here's what we actually have uh, on each shelf there. Uh, we've got, of course, our remote developer, wherever you are, connecting in through a VPN. And oh, I forgot my pointer. So we connect to the uh, development board, which is running Linux. And oh, so much for that idea. Um, uh, so that's our Z board. It's a development board that runs Linux. And we've got an analog digital converter evaluation board connected to it. Uh, that um, that's what we're developing a driver for. And to be able to test it, we've got a, what we call the M2K, that's like a Swiss army knife of a signal generator, a logic analyzer, oscilloscope, all in one, uh, to generate a signal and do any kind of testing. I have a motto that if we can measure it, we can understand it, so. We need our instruments to measure what we're doing to be able to test and verify that our driver is working. Uh, we also have a special power switch. This is something we've developed internally at Bay Labor. We call our co-pilot that can allow us to remotely cycle power on our development board. So if it ever hangs, crashes, whatever, we can reboot it remotely. And all of these things are connected with USB to a little mini PC. And we also connect to that through our VPN. And on our mini PC, uh, we're running graphical tools to be able to actually visualize what we're doing. The Scopy is the graphical interface for that Swiss Army Knife M2K gizmo that we can use to generate a signal or use it as an oscilloscope if we need to. And then we're also using the IIO oscilloscope program to actually capture data from our analog digital converter to be able to see, are we actually capturing the same signal that we're generating to know if our driver's working or not. So as some of you might guess if you've tried to do work like this before. Uh, trying to do this remotely without being able to actually get your hands on the hardware has some issues with it. So these are kind of the biggest pain points over the last six months that we've identified. Um, the first couple ones we've more or less figured out. Uh, the second two are still kind of causing us problems. So. Sharing resources, and when we first started, we had at one point four different people sharing one laptop that was connected to four development boards and had about 20 USB things plugged into it. That didn't work so well, so we sprung the money, got eight mini PCs, now everybody's got their own. That problem solved. Just took a little money and a little time, but easy problem to solve. The next one, the booting files, we tried a few different things. I've got a couple more slides on that, so I won't talk about the details just yet. Um, then the last two is on our setups, uh, we often have to swap out that analog digital converter that uh, we might have five or 10 similar ones that we're developing a single driver for X number of chips, and so we have to swap out the board to make sure it's working on all the different chips. And so since we're working remotely, some, we have to ping somebody in the office and say, hey, can you come switch out the board for us? Which is you know, kind of disruptive to them if they're trying to do other work, but that's also at the same time, that's their job, so they do it. At the, Maybe the biggest pain point has been the debugging actual physical electronics issues that the issues that are like noise, crosstalk, that's not a problem with your software, 
it's actually a physical electrical problem. So the remote developer is, can't do anything about it at all. We have to rely on whoever's in the office to have the time and knowledge and skills to be able to debug that. And so that one's particularly a problem because the remote developers, the one who's been reading all the data sheets, becoming the expert on that specific chip, and the person in the office doesn't know anything about it, and you're saying, hey, can you fix this for me? And they're like, uh, sure, yeah. <laughs> well, I have to learn the whole thing, how it works, but. Um, so jumping back to our uh, boot files, this one, we tr there's, you know, a few different things people recommend. Uh, we tried using an SD card mux, um, but those actually turned out to be more of a problem than a help. We had lots of electrical issues. They just didn't work. The, we would switch it and then not be able to connect to it anymore. So we gave up on using those. And you can also do like a TFTP boot, boot from network. Uh, we tried that, but we have three boot files that we need to update, and only two of those work over TFTP, so it didn't really completely solve the problem for us. So we decided to just keep things simple as possible. The, our development board uh, mounts the boot partition automatically at slash boot already, so we can just use secure shell as long as we can boot into Linux we can use Secure Shell to copy files into the boot partition, reboot our board, it comes up. Worst case scenario, you have a bad kernel, it crashes or something. Well, we've got our mini PC connected with a serial console, so we can get into the U-boot prompt and recover if we've got a bad kernel or bad device tree. So that only leaves the one bad case of the boot bin, which has the U-boot in it, if we botch that one, well, we're out of luck. Somebody at the office is gonna have to fix it for us, but luckily that one just doesn't happen very often. So that hasn't been a big problem. So kind of wrapping it up, uh, you know, is it possible to actually work like this? Um, you know, some of the reasons why we decided to work this way of having the hardware remotely is that we need multiple engineers all sharing the same hardware because we're developing a Linux driver, a bare metal driver, user space stuff, all for the same board. That's not always the same engineer, so there would be a lot of logistics trying to ship around the same board to every engineer, and we wanted to avoid that. Things get lost in the mail, the shipping costs add up, and not all the remote engineers have all of the equipment you need to test those hard problems. So that's our main motivation for having our setups the way they are. But uh, you know, there is a loss of efficiency of not being able to get your hands on the hardware yourself. So we have been making some exceptions for that, that when uh, one engineer, or there's only one software task for one engineer, then we've shipped them the board, or if we had a duplicate board, or some of the chips are just so incredibly complex that it makes more sense to ship it off and ship it back. So I don't know if everyone else on my team agrees with this conclusion, but I think overall it's been working well enough for us. Uh, we've been managing to get things upstream, so that leads me to my second adventure which is the first Linux driver I got upstream uh, using this method. So this is the adventure of the resolver, the digital converter. So uh, remember these tires, they come into the story later. So I, I'm guessing most of you don't know what a resolver is. I didn't either when I started this, so here's a 30 second crash course on what's a resolver. So it's this two-piece thing here. This is called a frameless resolver, and it's got a rotor. A little small part rotates. It's connected to an electrical coil that rotates. Then there's a stator. That's the bigger ring. It stays still. 
and it's connected to two more coils that are 90 degrees to each other. And the rotor coil, we energize with an electric field, and uh, that induces a voltage in the stator coils, and those signals go into a uh, resolver to digital converter chip, and since they're 90 degrees apart, we have a right triangle, the converter chip does some trigonometry, and you can figure out what angle the rotor is compared to the stator. So this is measuring the rotational position, and it also has a clock in it, so we can re measure rotational speed of how fast this rotor is spinning. So when I started, this is our first test setup that they had set up at our lab that I would connect to to develop the driver. Uh, it's got the same board running Linux uh, connected to the evaluation board with the resolver to digital converter chip. And then we have our uh, hardware store uh, set up of, we added a shaft and some brackets to mount our resolver so we could actually spin that rotor. But there's a few problems with this setup. Number one, it's human powered that uh, whenever we wanted to test our driver, we had to ping somebody on Slack to say, hey, can you go turn that shaft so we can make sure my driver's working? And um, also, since this has to measure speed, humans don't, turns out, they don't have a constant speed setting. You know, can you turn this one revolution per minute? Or they don't have a high speed setting. Can you turn this 10,000 revolutions per minute? And also, since that came in two pieces uh, that have no connection at all, it's called the floating resolver for a reason, you ca they can't touch, and there is a 0.5 millimeter air gap in between. So uh, our high precision hardware from the hardware store wasn't really up to that task. But do you know what is precision engineered to a fraction of a millimeter? That's right, Legos. <laughs> so I went to the office uh, and got to visit the office in France, and I brought back one of the duplicate boards we had with us. And since I've got that background in Lego robotics, uh, I built a, our version two setup where we can actually test this properly. So remember those tires I told you about from the 1980s space sets? Well, it turns out they're a perfect fit for the bevel in the resolver, because I needed something to grip it, to spin it with the motor. And then I built these little uh, gizmos with some worm gears to get precision alignment. That you can see there's four of them. So that I can, there's two degrees of freedom on each side of the resolver so we can get it exactly lined up, the two donut shapes, so they don't touch each other at all. So here's what it looks like in action. This is just doing a rotation test by hand to, it's measuring in radians. And then, to measure speed, the Lego motors actually have a um, encoder in them as well. So we can know the exact speed of the Lego motor and compare that to our resolver. So that's actually how I validated that our driver is in fact working and converting the speed correctly to radians per second. That's what the industrial IIO system uses. So hardware problem solved on to the next part of this is it turns out uh, to get this driver upstream, there was actually a a uh, driver that's been in staging, which is the corner of the kernel where uh, things that aren't quite ready to upstream sometimes go, uh, but need more work. So 
there'd been a driver in there for 13 years waiting for someone to love it. So uh, I also got to learn the lesson in this adventure of how do you get a driver out of staging? So number one, fix the bugs first. Always good practice when you're upstreaming anything. Number two, fix all the user space interface. Uh, in the industrial IIO subsystem, we have tons and tons of sysfs attributes for uh, all the different aspects of these kind of parts, and we try to use the standard ones as much as possible so that we don't end up with every single chip having its own unique um, attributes. So the driver and staging was basically reading and writing registers through these attributes, which is something maybe you do in debug FS, but not in industrial I.O., so we had to fix all that. Then uh, stuff in staging usually doesn't have device tree bindings, so you have to write that. And one thing to watch out for is don't let using a device tree property in your uh, driver sneak through without documenting it in the bindings YAML. Then you'll have grumpy DT maintainers. And then finally, once you fix all those things, we can actually move it out of staging. I did a go git format patch with no renames so that we could see the full driver on the mailing list, give it one final review as it was moving out. And then once you finally get it out of staging, then you can start adding all those shiny new features you wanted. So mission accomplished. Just took a little ingenuity and about 40 patches, and finally got that upstreamed. So speaking of upstream, that brings us to our last quick little adventures. Uh, some other things going on uh, upstream in the industrial IO subsystem. So we have the adventure of the spy offload. What's the spy offload? Well, the problem we're trying to solve is some of these analog digital converter chips uh, can do a million, two million samples per second, and we need to get that into the Linux kernel over a spy bus and uh, using what's out there in the kernel right now, we can get 10, maybe 100,000 if you've got a really fast uh, system, but yeah, nowhere near two million, and there's also all sorts of sources of jitter because when you're dealing with interrupts, they're not always happening at a regular interval. So you end up something like this. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? Yeah, we missed almost the entire sine wave, at least in this capture, because the kernel was busy uh, sending the previous capture over the network or something, I don't know. Um, so, our solution to this is spy offloading. So that's a way to do all of the spy transfers completely without any CPU intervention. So avoiding all of the interrupts altogether. So the way this works is we basically record a series of spy transactions, whatever it takes to read one sample from our analog digital converter chip. And then we're triggering it with a hardware trigger so for example, a pulse width modulation signal that can make a pulse one million times per second at regular intervals, so we get evenly spaced samples. Our received data um, gets piped to a DMA buffer. Uh, so we're getting all of the samples in one big buffer at one time, then we just get one single interrupt to tell us the buffer's full, and we can read that buffer. So that's eliminating all the jitter problems, and it's allowing us to get way more samples per second. So ta-da, it works. This is actually getting two million samples per second from a chip in Linux. So 
The good news is it works. The bad news is it's not quite all upstreamed yet. Um, so I send a series of patches for this upstream and uh, it got quite a few criticisms, but it's also, nobody said it was a bad idea. It was just the way I was going about it wasn't great. And so it's been suggested to break this down into smaller parts. So the first part uh, that's already been upstreamed already is this idea of pre-cooking or pre-preparing spy messages. So this is an optimization that uh, actually was talked about about 13 years ago on the spy mailing list. We resurrected this idea that um, whenever we're doing a spy transfer in the kernel, there's a lot of code running to verify all the parameters of the spy transaction. And so in a, like in an analog digital converter, when we're reading samples, we're doing the same transfer over and over and over again. So there's a lot of CPU time wasted uh, ver re-verifying that same transfer over and over again. So now, since the uh, 6.9 kernel, there's a new API to pre-optimize a message, or a spy message, to avoid some of that uh, overhead. And so the next steps for uh, breaking this down, because remember that I, the idea is to eventually have a way to record and play back spy transfers uh, completely from a hardware trigger. So um, the spy maintainer wants this to be kind of something even more general purpose that can uh, solve more problems than just ours, because that's how we do things in the Linux kernel. So uh, I'm kind of looking for other people with use cases, feedback hopefully, to figure out how we can make this work the best for everybody. Uh, the, in the IIO subsystem, we can already start using that pre-optimization to make uh, IIO drivers more efficient. Um, the, one of the ideas also thrown around was a lot of uh, Spy drivers can do DMA mapping, that that part could be moved to the pre-optimization to optimize that even more. Uh, a lot of people interested in this were using CAN controllers. So if you're interested in that, this is probably something you wanna look into. The, there's a couple spy controllers that are specialized for spy memory that have a lookup table where you can pre-program spy commands and play them back by a hardware trigger. So that exactly fits that paradigm that I mentioned before. So maybe there's an opportunity to also improve some performance with spy flash memory using this. Um, and the last idea is from the spy maintainer of a lot of the embedded systems nowadays have extra microcontroller cores, like maybe the PRU on a BeagleBone that we could use to also be a spy offload to improve port performance in any way you want. So that was spy offload. Uh, next quick adventure is the adventure of the IIO backend framework. This is also something new in the industrial IIO subsystem. Uh, what was the problem we're solving? Well, some folks from STM32 had uh, this ADC uh, IP block and a digital filter IP block that are separate blocks, so have separate drivers, but they needed to somehow connect them into a single logical device in the IIO subsystem. Analog devices had something similar where they have an analog chip and then they have this Axie ADC FPGA block that reads data at super high rates that they need to somehow connect into a single logical device in the kernel. So we came up with the idea of a front end and a back end. So the front end is gonna be that analog digital converter, and the back end is gonna be the digital filter or whatever that other block is. And now you can write uh, 
device tree bindings with a provider consumer thing to connect them together very simply. And in your drivers, you can register a back end and a front end gets that back end. The, so the IO back end framework is doing all the heavy lifting of connecting those together for you. And now you can have an easy way to write a single IO driver that's using multiple pieces of hardware. And last little quick one is the adventure of the IIO DMA buff. The problem we're solving for here, this one is getting more data from point A to point B. For example, uh, this use, initial use case was some software-defined radio stuff where they wanted to get 64 megabytes of samples from the IIO subsystem out over a USB connection as fast as possible. So we have this new DMA buff framework. The way it works, DMA buff is an API in the kernel to move DMA buffers between subsystems or user space and the kernel. So we can create a buffer in user space. We can attach it to an IIO device now using some IOctals and capture some samples in that buffer detach that buffer from the IIO subsystem, and then reattach it to the USB function, and then tell USB to send that out over uh, the USB. So that really improves performance a lot by avoiding copying the data from the IIO buffer to the USB buffer. It just, we just move the handle instead. So in this one, test case, they were over doubled their throughput while at the same time reducing CPU usage. So that's a really nice optimization there too. So that concludes my adventures in the IIO subsystem and we'll open it up for questions. With the spy offloading, my assumption is that you were starting not with bit banging, but you started with a, a spy driver that had hardware support, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And then offloading was one level beyond hardware support. You're, that makes sense now. Right, yeah. Anything that's going to do offloading is going to require special hardware that knows about uh, being able to have a hardware trigger or yep. piping the received data somewhere else. Thanks. So the the peripheral in question is an Axie uh, FPGA peripheral that Analog Devices makes. You can find uh, documentation. It's open source. You can find documentation on wiki.analog.com, and the HDL is also available. Hi, thank you for the presentation, and I think it was really great because it has always been very challenging to test sensor drivers remotely, at least. Uh, so I, I just have a basic question. Did you require any kind of human input at some point, um, or any challenges in that case, while you were testing the driver for it? Yeah, usually we need somebody to set up the hardware and attach a uh, signal generator or logic analyzer, whatever we need to the hardware. But once that's done, we can connect to that remote PC and control all that remotely. So it's, we're trying to minimize the extra human need, but. Okay. So once the basic setup is done, um, after that, you still need some hum human support for that? Uh, not unless there's a not really yet. strange problem. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So on your um, oscilloscope and stuff, are you able to, uh, is the remote user able to see the, the screens from the oscilloscope app, or are they 
Yes, we're using a remote desktop to access that mini PC. Okay. So we can see everything on it and use it just like we're there. Okay, that's great. Really cool. So the, the M2K that was being used uh, is called Adam 2000, and in fact, it's actually a complete Linux system. So it's based on a Sync MP, no, on a, on a, on a Sync 7000. It runs Linux and also runs I.O. for all the different uh, blocks in, inside that, that unit for um, signal generator, ADC stacks, and so on. And so you can also remotely connect to that unit, so you, you don't really need need it. Um, kind of the Scopy evaluation software running directly connected to the device. You can also use it across a VPN and run that uh, software on a, on a different PC, maybe in a different uh, location. The latency is a little better though when you're local. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the talk. I was wondering about, uh, for what I understand, uh, you were mostly using it for development, your uh, setup with uh, the compu remote computer and stuff, but I was also using it for testing and CI purposes. Uh, yeah, most of this is go just manual testing since we have to generate a physical signal. But the, I mean, my typical setup is I'm writing the kernel stuff at my computer at home, compiling the kernel there, and then using SCP to copy the kernel to the remote board, and then reboot the remote board. And then the remote mini PC is just the user interface for the logic analyzer, any tools like that. That fully answered your question? Yeah, thank you. Great. If you were to take it the next step and have it be more of a CI type of setup, does the does that M2K scope and stuff provide the ability to script it and not have it visual, but to maybe capture some logs and do some comparing yeah. with automated tooling? Yeah, like Michael said, we can connect to it remotely with uh, anything that talks IIO, user space stuff. Okay. It's all using the IIO stack. So any compatible tool works with that, and we've made a Python script so far just to create a simple sine wave, but it could be automated much more. Uh, real quick, um, reservations for the boards so you can share them between developers. Did you homebrew a script for that or did you use something that you found in the community? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So like to prevent, say, two developers from trying to use a board at the same time. Oh, yeah. The, we have a, we use uh, Snipe It for keeping track of assets. So we made a set up asset that people check out one board or two board or two setups and then we'll we can use that to see who's using them okay thank you but we try not to have two people working on the same thing at the same time so that it's just not a problem of having to take turns With the continued development of uh, cheaper SPCs and such, what stopped uh, you from building more custom test harnesses to test some of these devices instead of building off of what looks to be, I think you said it's a, a Xilinx Zinc uh, 
uh, development kit, why not build your own platform? The, a lot of the analog digital converter chips we have are uh, using an evaluation board with the FMC connector, and that's already built into the zinc, and there's lots of history of testing, developing and testing these devices with that hardware, so we're just sticking with it. Thanks all for your questions and thanks for listening.